Duquesne University, founded in 1878 by the Missionary-Oriented Congregation of the Holy Spirit, opened its doors with only 40 students. Today, Duquesne University is a sprawling 50-acre microcity with over 8,000 students. Duquesne University, originally known as the Pittsburgh Catholic College, offered classes in rented space above a commercial bakery on Wiley Avenue. While the early administration struggled to launch the school, it is reported that the original students struggled with concentration as the aroma of baking bread rose from the bakery below. In the mid-1880s, the school purchased property atop Boyd's Hill, overlooking the Monongahela River and Pittsburgh's south side, adopting the land that would eventually become the site of the iconic administration building, Old Main. In 1885, the building, now serving as the university's administration building, was built as a multi-purpose structure, housing a chapel, an auditorium, a bakery, a cafeteria, in addition to classrooms, labs, a dormitory, and some administrative offices. Today, Duquesne University encompasses over 10 major academic programs spanning innovative majors to traditional degrees. By the end of the 1880s, the Pittsburgh Catholic College had accomplished something that 75% of other Catholic colleges had failed to do. And that was to survive. The college's reputation was strong and attractive to the growing student body. One of the earliest catalysts for success was Father John Tuhill Murphy. He instituted practical vocational training, intending to give the growing blue-collar migrant students an education that could better their chances in the industrial town that Pittsburgh was. The courses Father Murphy introduced in the college's curriculum aimed students for jobs beyond their blue collar status. In 1889, by the third year of Father Murphy's tenure, the Pittsburgh Catholic College awarded its first bachelor's degrees in arts and sciences, thus enshrining the inaugural school that has become McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts. Today, the McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts proudly offers over 65 undergraduate, graduate, doctoral, professional, and certificate degrees. Students from every continent study in one of the many modern and innovative classrooms. Dean Christine Blair has dedicated her work and service to the success of students in the McAnulty College since her arrival in 2019. Dean Blair is a lifelong practicing advocate for liberal arts. Today, Dean Blair has a deep commitment to the legacy of the liberal arts college's namesake, Father Henry McAnulty. Hello. I'm Christine Blair, Dean of the McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts at Duquesne University, and I'm delighted to contribute to this video celebrating the life, leadership, and legacy of Father Henry J. McAnulty, who served as the ninth president of Duquesne University from 1959 to 1980. As Dean, I'm immensely proud our college was the first academic unit and that our origin story begins with Duquesne University's in 1878. I'm equally honored that our past, our present, and our future will always be aligned with the visionary leadership of Father Henry J. McAnulty. 
It's vital to me that every member of our liberal arts community, especially our newest members, understand the college's history and continue to work to live the mission that Father McAnulty inspired, one inherently connected to the role of a liberal arts education in the 21st century. The naming of the college soon after Father McAnulty's death in 1995 is a tribute to his ability to bring the community together in a time of great crisis when the university faced severe fiscal challenge and wasn't sure if it would survive. It's also a tribute to a transparent leadership style that enabled Father Mac to courageously reach out to students, many from the liberal arts, for help and to share in the workload and the credit of a masterful grassroots fundraising campaign. Undoubtedly, this is the hallmark of Duquesne's emphasis on serving God by serving students who in turn serve others. Our narrator, Dr. Rita Furco Joyce, was one of those students in the liberal arts who, along with her husband, Dr. Pat Joyce, were campus leaders who continued to serve as exemplars and role models at Duquesne, but especially in the McAnulty College. There's a beautiful photograph in College Hall that features Father McAnulty speaking to an assembly of students, with Pat Joyce featured prominently in the foreground. To me, it's inspirational because it reflects the way that Father McAnulty was able in that crisis moment to inspire the students of Duquesne, now our Golden Dukes, to apply their minds, hearts, and spirits to find another solution to that crisis moment, the third alternative. In our campus nomenclature, we're often referred to simply as the college or just as arts, but I find it important to reiterate that we are the McAnulty College and will always be the McAnulty College in the same way that Father McAnulty will always be regarded as the president of Duquesne University who, with the help of so many, saved this university. In my time at Duquesne, I've heard stories from our distinguished alumni, now business executives, lawyers, and educators, who recalled going door to door in Pittsburgh neighborhoods to raise funds to save Duquesne. They did so humbly, yet passionately, with a spirit of mercy, grace, and love. We are here because they were there. My role as Dean is to help our current community of students, faculty, and staff remember and honor Father McAnulty and our alumni's legacy of service to understand what a degree in liberal arts stands for. This includes our commitment to equipping our graduates with the essential skills and dispositions of ethical decision making and creative problem solving in a culture of civil discourse and servant leadership. Today, we achieved this goal across nearly 30 majors and minors and close to 30 graduate programs and encourage our students to diversify their thinking so that they can reimagine our world and contribute to the public good. From his calling to the priesthood, to his military service as a chaplain, and to his transformational role as Duquesne University president, you'll learn more about Father McAnulty's journey through a comprehensive and engaging history written by Dr. Jim Fitzpatrick, a double duker with a 1974 undergraduate degree in liberal arts and a 1977 graduate degree in education, who also interviewed both Pat and Rita Joyce. Their shared history, aligned with the many archival images throughout, allow Father McAnulty's journey to guide our actions and live in our collective memory for years to come. Henry Joseph McAnulty was born on April 25, 1915 in the shady side section of the city of Pittsburgh. He was educated at Sacred Heart Grade School, Central Catholic High School, and Duquesne University, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree, majoring in philosophy and English in 1936. Following his studies, Henry experienced a call to the priesthood. He applied and was accepted into the Congregation of the Holy Ghost, now referred to as the Spiritans, the religious sponsoring order of Duquesne University. He was sent to St. Mary's Seminary in Norwalk, Connecticut, where he earned a Bachelor in Theology degree. He was ordained a priest 
and a member of the Congregation of the Holy Ghost on November 11, 1939. The combination of a Duquesne degree, being ordained a priest, and a member of the Holy Ghost Order would, in two decades, launch an extraordinary and unique career in higher education. Father McAnulty's career would be one of demonstrating unparalleled qualities of faith, fearlessness, leadership, strength, motivation, determination, inspiration, vision, and most importantly, dedication to his students, faculty, and staff. Thousands of Duquesne graduates and generations of students yet to come owe a debt of gratitude to Father Mack. It was his great strength of character that was most needed to secure the future of Duquesne University. He entered the chaplain school at Harvard University and was later sent to the Air Force Gunnery School in Harlingen, Texas, and various military schools and bases for the next few years. Between 1945 and 1958, Father Mack was assigned to multiple domestic and international military bases, finally retiring in 1975 at the rank of Brigadier General, the first Catholic chaplain to be accorded such an honor. In 1958, Father Vernon Gallagher, president of Duquesne University, was elected provincial of the Congregation of the Holy Ghost. Upon his election, Father Mack, who only knew him slightly, sent Gallagher a note of congratulations. Some days later, he received a note from Father Gallagher suggesting that he return to Duquesne. Since this was not an order, Father Mack politely declined, outlining his reasons that he should stay in his current assignment. Father Mack received a second letter from Father Gallagher addressing his concerns and again inviting him to return. Father Mack replied to the second request by telling Father Gallagher that he had no experience in higher education, he was not a scholar, and expressed concerns that he would not be accepted at the university because he did not have a terminal degree. When he received a third letter from Father Gallagher, he knew that this was no longer a request and that he would have to return because he had taken a vow of obedience. And he said in those days, the word of the superior was the word of God. During his first year at Duquesne, Father McAnulty studied the campus from many perspectives. Although he knew his role at Duquesne, he didn't necessarily like it. He completed his first year wiser and poised to accomplish great things. The duties of both president and provincial became overwhelming for Father Gallagher and he decided to resign as university president and appointed Father Henry J. McAnulty as the ninth president of Duquesne University. In those days, there were no committees or national searches conducted. The provincial appointed the president. As Father McAnulty considered the enormous challenges associated with this appointment, he pondered about the challenges any new president would face at Duquesne. What was the role of a Catholic university? How could this Catholic university integrate into this Pittsburgh community? And could he create an inspiring and engaging environment for students, faculty, and staff? As Father McAnulty pondered these questions, his response to the third question was to review the unfinished master plan, 
developed by Father Gallagher and Willard Rockwell. Father Mack began reviewing, revising, and redesigning a master plan that would initiate tremendous changes that would be the renaissance of Duquesne University and be the legacy of Henry J. McAnulty. Father Mack consulted with city planners and architects. He knew that if he wanted to recruit excellent faculty and staff, he needed better facilities. It became McAnulty's mission to provide an attractive campus with the illusion of space with modern facilities. The Gallagher Master Plan was estimated to cost $13.3 million. The revised plan grew to an estimated cost of $20 million. The Pittsburgh Urban Redevelopment Authority had a goal of remodeling existing structures rather than tearing down and rebuilding whenever possible. Father Mack recognized that this was also a cost savings to the university, so their goal was aligned. Father McAnulty hired a new director of university planning and a revamped master plan was adopted, now estimated at $24 million. The city of Pittsburgh approved Father Mack's plans and forwarded them to Washington, D.C. to be included in the city's comprehensive Bluff Street Redevelopment Program. While waiting for the government's approval of the new plan, Father Mack turned his attention to the university's curriculum, new degrees, and establishing the Faculty Senate. In 1962, the federal government approved the Bluff Street Renewal Project and Duquesne's $24 million master plan. That year also saw the construction of St. Martin's Hall approximately 924,000 square feet of land was made available to Duquesne at $1.05 per square foot. Father Mack said he was able to acquire $10 million of property for between $900,000 and $1 million. In meeting with Pittsburgh's leaders, Father Mack had to demonstrate that Duquesne was not supported by the Catholic Church, but instead relied on tuition, fees, state and federal grants, contributions by private sources, and the contributed services of the Holy Ghost Fathers. When the campaign was announced, the dormitories were under construction. Renovations were underway to convert a garage into the School of Music. Plans were under development for the Duquesne Union and College Hall. Ground was broken for the Science Center. Land had been acquired. New streets were being laid. And $7.5 million had been raised. During this time, Father Mack was balancing the budget with the tuition income. During the 1963-1964 academic year, enrollment was 7,088 students, with 1,111 students living in campus housing. In March 1964, a loan was secured to build the student union. 1965 saw the opening of St. Martin's and Assumption Halls. Demolition was underway for the construction of the Student Union. Enrollment grew to 7,114 students with 391 faculty and 5.8 acres were added to the campus. Although the university had assumed enormous debt, all seemed well 
1965. However, dark clouds were gathering in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Duquesne was about to be hit by an economic tsunami that was forming east and north of the campus. The University of Pittsburgh, one of the oldest universities in the country, was facing financial difficulties. Pitt faced three options. One, to significantly increase its tuition. Two, become a Pennsylvania state-related institution. Or three, to close its doors. On August 23rd, 1966, the governor of Pennsylvania signed legislation making the University of Pittsburgh a state-related institution. Immediately, tuition at Pitt dropped by $1,000 per year, thus making Pitt a far more financially affordable school than Duquesne. Soon after that, the Allegheny County commissioners announced the establishment of the community college system. This new system, along with Pitt's decreased tuition, posed a real threat to Duquesne's enrollment. As a symbol of Father McAnulty's leadership, he organized meetings among private colleges in Pittsburgh and other parts of the state. He co-founded three groups to secure the interest of private higher education. Father Mac's leadership resulted in the state master plan for higher education, including provisions for low interest guaranteed loans for students in private institutions and institutional assistance grants, which gave funds to private schools based on the number of Pennsylvania students attending. Enrollment, tuition costs, budget challenges, all led to a financial cliff in 1970. Duquesne's debt service became a staggering $46 million. Father McAnulty feared the tides had finally turned against Duquesne. On Tuesday, April 21, 1970, Father McAnulty canceled classes for a State of the University address to the students, faculty, and staff. On that fateful day, what seemed like the beginning of the end of Duquesne. Instead, the result of that day's proceedings led to what was the beginning of the rebirth of Duquesne in the most unlikely way. Here is the story of how Father McAnulty's leadership inspired light where only darkness appeared. Hello. Hello. Hey, hello. My name is James Fitzpatrick. I am a graduate of what is now known as the McAnulty College of Liberal Arts and also a graduate of the School of Education. I am pleased to be here with two longtime friends and associates and colleagues to um, talk about a significant period in the history of Duquesne University. Uh, for any of us who were fortunate enough to be here in the decade of the 60s and the 70s, during Duquesne's financial crisis, there are two indispensable individuals who were the originators and prime movers of a student effort to save the university, which was entitled The Third Alternative, Students to Save Duquesne. Dr. Rita Furco Joyce, who also holds a license in canon law, was president of what was then called the Student Congress, and Dr. Patrick Joyce was the chairman of the Third Alternative effort. Pat and Rita, thank you, what you for what you did decades ago for the university. And thank you for being part, an essential part, of this effort to perpetuate, explain, and pay tribute to the le legacy of Father Henry J. McAnulty, the ninth president of Duquesne University. How did the two of you, and if there were others, <laughs> first learn of the financial crisis the university was facing? How we first found out is that they laid out the situation with a problem and um, the budget committee of the university 
um, by virtue of the fact that the students were on the administrative council also had a student on the budget committee of the university. That happened to be Pat Joyce. And that's where I come in on. And yes. Um, I was the chair of the budget committee of student government. And as, as that position, I was put on the b budget committee of the university. Uh, that's when we first learned that there was a major problem. And he outlined the problem. And the problem was immense, but it was immediate. And uh, essentially, he told us that we were running short of cash, a cash flow problem that could lead to uh, insolvency, not being able to pay the bills. And so that's when Father McInerney said to the committee, um, we have two alternatives. We can raise tuition in the middle of the year or we can close our doors. That's that simple. And they and, didn't specifically say to the students, think about it. They said to the vice presidents of the university, we have to come to some decision in the next two weeks. That, that particular meeting. That particular meeting. meeting was a budget meeting. Yeah. And they provided us with two alternatives that we had to think about and come back and, and discuss uh, and resolve. I happened to be in the office. Several other of the officers happened to be in the office. We sat down and started discussing it. I'd like to show you this. Uh, this is the button that I wore. Basically, it says, if you are not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that's the attitude that the student government mm, took yeah. to this crisis. So we sat there and we talked about it. And we came up with the fact that we needed to offer to do something. We would raise money. That led to two weeks of saying, mm -hmm. how are we going to do, what, what should we do? And what, what are we going to do? We have to provide a solution. Because and closing the doors was unacceptable. We just loved Duquesne. So we came up with a third alternative. So the million dollars target was what we brought back to the students, that we are short a million dollars. We felt that students would respond favorably. We didn't know how many. Of course we didn't know how many. But Pat had an excellent point at that time that you know, they have to know what we know. We can't possibly just say, we're going to raise money and not explain to them how the university got here. It was about five or six of us sitting in the, in the student union office, um, the student government office, and brainstorming together we came up with an idea. Let's tell Father McAnulty that we will try to raise the money if he opens up to the students and the faculty and the university and just tells how we got into this situation. <laughs> so we, we decided to go over and present that that night, the day of the, the budget meeting, that we heard this. So six, seven hours later, um, I think it was 9 o'clock at night, um, <laughs> It was dark. <laughs> well, and, 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 We're getting dark. Yeah. And it was, it's scary to go to Trinity Hall. <laughs> we, 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 it was off limits back then. Sure, yeah. sure. So students were not allowed on Trinity Hall campus gr grounds. It was a private lo residence for the Holy Ghost yeah. Fathers. And we Trinity rang the, the doorbell. <laughs> and it was dark in the hallway, dark. And the light came on, and Father Loritis, who is Vice President for University Relations, mm -hmm. he came out, and he was looking through the door, and he opened the door and said, yes. We'd like to see the President, Father McInerney. And he said, do you have an appointment? And I said, we said, no. <laughs> he said, uh, is he not expecting you? He said, no. And about 10 minutes, 15, no, yeah. it was, yeah. It, it wasn't was, long. We hear this shuffling, and it was Father McInerney, the president of the university, in his bed bedtime <laughs> slippers. <laughs> you got him out of bed, I guess. And well, where he was working, but he had his slippers on anyway. <laughs> we sat in the room, and we said, we're concerned, Father, like we all are, but we have a proposal. Um, the student government would like to commit to you, to the university, to the community to raise a million dollars. Well, he said, isn't that nice? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know. I mean, yeah, I can't, I can't remember exactly but what he, he said he was, either. But he was yeah, at that time. not patronizing. He was warm as he always was. But he said, and, and how will you do that? And we said, 
I have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea, but we'll do a lot. We'll, we'll, we will we'll figure it out. But I think the way we can do that, Father, is if you told the whole university, what's the problem? How do we get here? And be honest with them, as you always are, but tell them the truth, and we'll propose a third alternative. And in order to do that, Father, you're going to have to cancel class. Uh, but the point was that um, unless we had students, faculty, and staff together to hear this message, that it, we didn't think it could work. He agreed. And he accepted right away. He agreed. He said, OK, yeah. let's give it a try. Uh, that was extraordinary. If you stop and think, students were protesting all over the country in all different re ways and reasons. And gathering everybody together and telling everybody that we had a financial problem that might close the doors, um, who knows how that room could have erupted, how that room could have, you know, it could have been question and answer, question and answer, I, you know, it, it could have been negative. He agreed to give it a shot. That, that was a pivotal moment. Yeah, and the students in the ballroom reacted positively. And she said there were more than 400 signatures of people who wanted to help. There were people who thought these were good kids mm. as opposed to those mm. bad kids. Right. And we fought that and we stood against that because we weren't good or bad kids, we were both. Yeah, we were everybody. You know, we, on campus, we, we, like a whole mixed bag. Our common yeah. cause was this university was worth saving, and that president was trustworthy, was believable, was someone that you could you could believe he was telling the truth, and we 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 loved him. I thought about this a lot. Um, he was the epitome of servant leader. It's one thing to lead. It's another thing to serve. Um, he understood both. He could make a decision, but he always spoke the truth. And Vernon Gallagher saw leadership in, in Harry McInerney. Uh, I believe that with all my heart. And the other part of my answer is the Holy Spirit has a lot to do with this. He was the right man at the right at time. the right time the right set of in the right set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've mm -hmm. often said mm -hmm. that this, the situation that occurred while we were students with the solution, a, aka the third alternative, could not have happened under a different person. It was Father who Father Mac who was so willing to give us a chance to try something, and he wasn't afraid to try it. All things came together so neatly and yeah. so nicely in a very, very, very difficult period of time. Yeah. But the, the motto of the university, Spiritans, is the, it is the spirit that gives life. Um, and uh, you had a, a leader in Father McInerney who had all of the humility, as I said before, of a servant leader. Um, and he taught us the, the, the way of humility, truth, um, and self-inspired, do it, get, get it done. You talked, Jim, about how he was a mentor but also a hero, and truly he was my hero. Amazing, amazing man. With a successful student-initiated third alternative campaign, helping Father Mac address the immediate financial crisis. There remained other issues to be addressed. Similar to every college campus in America, war, race, and gender rights protests took place on Duquesne's campus. All of the goodwill and excitement around a revitalized Duquesne University led to a growth in enrollment to 8,425 students in the fall of 1971. During this time, Father McAnulty navigated some challenging issues 
that exemplified his compassion for student expression and the direction core to the university's mission. Father Mack announced in 1977, with the exception of an athletic facility, the goals of the master plan had been completed. The university would now begin the planning to celebrate Duquesne's centennial celebration for 1978. On May 11, 1979, Father Henry J. McAnulty submitted notice to the Board of Directors of his intention to retire at the conclusion of the 1979-1980 academic year. The Board accepted his resignation and appointed him Chancellor of the University, the first president to receive this distinction. Father Mack retired as the ninth president of Duquesne University on July 1, 1980. When people were asked what was Father Mack's greatest accomplishment, everyone pointed to the building program. When Father Mack was asked, he said, students did not need to commend the university for doing anything, but when they did, that was the greatest accomplishment. His legacy continues to point to a shared responsibility to sustain the university and how Father Mack represented values that instilled in those students a sense of servant leadership that the McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts honors to this day. Father McAnulty was asked to reflect on the financial crisis of the late 60s and early 70s. He was asked why he thought that the University of Pittsburgh, with less than half of the debt service he had, was unable to survive as an independent, but Duquesne did survive. He leaned back, folded his arms, looked up and said, it was the Holy Ghost. In 1958, of all the Holy Ghost fathers with university experience and terminal degrees, why did Father Gallagher pick Father McAnulty to lead Duquesne University? Perhaps if Father Gallagher were here to ask, he probably would say, it was the Holy Ghost. <laughs>